went and added. So here we go. We're with looking at specific heat today. And first we're going to look at the definition of specific heat. It says the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat, which we represent with a lowercase q, required to raise the temperature of one gram of the The unit that we use for specific heat is a lowercase c. And the units of c, the units of little c, are joules per gram degree Celsius. In fact, you see those right here. So these are all specific heats or lowercase c's. And again, what you want to think about is if you look at these values of all these specific heats for aluminum, gold, copper, um, iron, so on and so forth, let's think about water. If you have one gram of water, one gram of water, since the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed, that means if you have one cubic centimeter of water, now this is not the scale, okay, Mr. Dion is not a very good artist, but if you had one, you know, milliliter of water, the amount of energy that it takes to raise the temperature one degree Celsius. So if you went from, you know, 10 to 11 degrees Celsius, right? How much energy does it take? Or to go from, a, from you know, 90 to 91, or to go from, you know, 22 to 23? Well, whatever. It's going to take 4.184 joules to raise that one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So... Now, you just might be thinking, okay, well, that's, that's great. Okay, well, awesome, cool, yeah, wonderful. Well, let's compare that to something else, okay? Let's say we had one gram of iron, okay? So one gram of iron, again, iron has a higher density than water, so it's not going to be one centimeter cube. But let's just say we had, you know, a little piece of iron, okay, that was one gram exactly. So we've got one gram of water and one gram of iron. Well, if we want to raise the temperature of that one gram of iron by one degree Celsius, you can see it takes a lot less energy, doesn't it? Okay. It takes about 10 times less the amount of energy to raise the temperature of that one gram of iron by one degree Celsius. In fact, this is something that we see all the time in our lives. Imagine these two scenarios that I have down here. Imagine if you took a pot that's just made out of a metal and they said down here, now the units are a little different. They're using joules per kilogram Kelvin, but look at the specific heat. You can see it's, what is it? Um, uh, 1,007 joules per kilogram times Kelvin, okay? If you heat a pot that's empty, there's nothing inside this metal pot. If you put a metal pot on the stove and turn on a flame, uh, you know, a gas burner, that's going to heat up pretty darn quick, right? Can you imagine if you let that sit for one minute? Imagine you take a pot that's empty, you put it on a flame, for one minute. Would you dare to touch that pot after one minute? I wouldn't because that would burn your hands. Why? Because the specific heat of metals, as you can see, is lower than that of water. If we had a pot that has water in it, let's say, and we put it on a hot flame for one minute, big pot of water, after one minute, would you be afraid to touch the sides of the pot? I wouldn't. The reason why is because we know it's going to take a lot more energy to fill up that pot once it's filled with water. It takes a lot of energy to warm up water, doesn't it? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why when you live near a big body of water, it, it um, causes the climate to be more temperate, right? Because during the summer months, the water absorbs a lot of heat and the water holds on to that heat. It takes a long time to lose that heat. And so it's gonna be cold in the winter. The converse holds true. And as the body of water cools over the winter months, once the warmer weather arrives, what that body of water that's been cooled down over the course of the winter, that's going to remain cold. It takes longer to heat it up. And so it's going to make, a, you know, sort of cooler breezes, right? That's going to come off of the body of water. Anyhow, so that's what specific heat is. Specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat energy that's required to raise the temperature of one gram of that substance by one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Remember, the reason, if you're like, well, you're mixing up units here, Mr. Dion. One minute you're talking about Celsius, the next minute you're talking about Kelvin. Remember that as we, the, the increments in temperature in degrees Celsius and Kelvin are the exact same, right? If a temperature increases by 25 degrees Celsius, it's also going to increase by 25 Kelvin, right? If you go from zero to 25 degrees Celsius, your temperature is going to go from 273 
to 298, it's still an increase of 25 units. Okay, so that's why we can mix up those units like that. The heat capacity of a substance is the amount of heat that's required to raise the temperature of any given quantity. Okay, at just a given mass of that substance by one degree Celsius. So we're not dealing with, you know, blocks that are one gram. It could be one, 10 grams, 10,000 grams, a billion grams, okay, whatever. So if we used the large letter C for heat capacity, what's going to happen when we multiply mass in grams by joules per gram degree Celsius? Well, you can see that grams are going to cancel out like that. And so the units for C, big C, or heat capacity, are going to be joules per degree Celsius, right? Because a heat capacity is assigned to a specific given quantity of a substance. And so you need to be fully aware of this equation, that heat capacity is equal to mass times heat capacity. If we want to calculate the amount of heat absorbed or released, there's two ways that we can do it, okay? Our heat, again, we use lowercase q. We can calculate it as being q is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Since we know that mass times specific heat is equal to big C, heat capacity, we could also just substitute that in, right, for the big C, and we could say that q is equal to heat capacity multiplied by delta T. Now, delta T, I'm sure that everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice knows how to calculate delta T. It's going to be TF or T final minus T initial. I've never taught this before in my class, but one of the things that I've learned from one of my colleagues is they said, well, an easy way to memorize this formula is that it kind of looks like, have you guys ever heard of the MCAT exam? MCAT, M-C-A-T, kind of looks like that because a delta kind of looks like an at. I don't know. If you find that it helps you, by all means, use it, okay? Q is equal to M cap. Anyhow, kind of something to think about then. But anyhow, when we're talking about, you know, how much heat does it take to um, cause a certain substance to raise a certain amount of degrees Celsius or degrees Kelvin, we would apply one of these two equations, okay? Depending on whether we have the heat capacity or the specific heat. With that in mind, let's take a look at a problem. Hey, and it involves our good friend water. We have 466 grams of water and we're heating it from 8.50 degrees Celsius. That's pretty cold water. And we're heating it up to 74.6. That's pretty warm water, right? That's like, uh, I don't know, a really hot, hot tub, I guess. So this is our T initial and our T final. Anyhow, let's read the rest of the problem. It says, calculate the amount of heat absorbed by the water. Well, the first thing we need is an equation. And we know that Q is equal to MCAT, right? Here I go. I'm using it already. The reason I chose this problem is because we're given the mass is equal to 466 grams. We know that we can calculate delta T because delta T is going to be equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature. I've already gone ahead and done that for myself, which is... 74.60 degrees Celsius, subtract um, 8.50 degrees Celsius, and you get that your delta T is equal to 66.1 degrees Celsius. So now I have my delta T, I have my mass. Where am I going to get my specific heat? Well, if you go back a couple of slides, and I can show you where this is in the table right here, the specific heat for water was... 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Let's write that down. Our C is equal to 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, like that. All right, let's plug some numbers in and make sure that our units cancel before we make any harsh judgments as to whether we're correct or incorrect. Okay, so our Q is going to be equal to our mass in grams, 466 grams, multiplied by our specific heat, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, multiplied by our delta T, which is 66.1 degrees Celsius. You can see that our temperature units cancel and our mass units cancel, 
remember the amount of heat absorbed is going to be having the units of joules. So looks reasonable to me. When you multiply all of that out in your calculator, you get 466 times 4.184 times 66.1. You get this big number, okay? Now, how many significant figures should there be in the final answer? I'll ask that to my students. Who could tell me how many sig figs there should be in my final answer? While you're doing that, I'll write down what I get, which is... Yeah, exactly. All my students are correct. The answer is, that means I'm going to round this 8 up because the number that follows it is 8, which is above 5. And so I'm going to write this down as 129 kilojoules. So I just divided that by 1,000. So that's the amount of heat that's absorbed when we warm that 466 grams of water from 8.5 to 74 0.6 degrees Celsius. Pretty cool, huh? All right. Well, with that in mind, let's try some more practice. More practice can never hurt. It says here, calculate the amount of heat required to warm 357 grams of ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. And they give you a specific heat from zero degrees Celsius to 110 degrees Celsius. I'm going to give you a second to try this one. All right, did anybody get an answer for this one? I'll ask my students before I carry on. Anybody get an answer for this one? Yeah, exactly. Somebody wrote D, uh, a couple of people wrote D, and they're both correct. Well, let's see how we would solve this problem. We're going to use our formula, Q is equal to m cat mc times delta t. We're given our mass, which is 357 grams. We're given our specific heat, which is 2.42 joules per gram Kelvin. And then we're also given our temperature change. Our T final is 110 degrees Celsius. And our initial temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Now, why can I mix these units? You see how I just went ahead and mixed these units. The reason why is because we know that the increments of temperature in joules and Kelvin are the same. Not the same scale, but the increments are the same. If something, the temperature of, of, a, of, a, of something raises by one degree Celsius, it's also raised by one Kelvin. And so our C, we could even report that as being 2.42 joules per gram degree Celsius. Let's do that. Now you can see that temperature units cancel, as do units of mass. When you plug all of that into your calculator, you get that your Q is equal to 9.50 times 10 to the power of 4 joules. If we convert that into kilojoules, because all of our answers are provided in kilojoules, we divide by 1,000, and we end up with 95.0 kilojoules. And so the answer is D. Very good. As I told you before I started lecturing today, we were going to talk about two types of calorimetry. Constant volume calorimetry and constant pressure calorimetry. Let's start by discussing constant volume calorimetry. Now, constant volume calorimetry is performed in something called a bombed calorimeter. It's not like a bomb that blows up, but that's what we call it. And in fact, the bomb, as far as I know, is this, this portion that's inside right here. What's important that you understand in constant volume calorimetry is that no heat enters or leaves the calorimeter. So we know that if a reaction releases heat, Where's that heat going to go? Okay, well, let me explain. 
the way the vo constant volume calorimeter works is like this. You have a big metal housing on the outside. And on the inside, you have some water. So this is water on the inside. You can see it says here H2O filled container. OK, now we know the specific heat of water. So where the reaction actually occurs is inside the bomb, which is jacketed or surrounded by water. Inside this bomb, which is airtight, so um, it's not going to do any pressure volume work, right? Because the gas is not going to be able to expand. What we have down there is we have our sample, which is going to be, um, which is going to undergo combustion. So it's combined with oxygen. And then you have some kind of electrical source with some wires going in there or some electrodes. And what that do, what that does rather, is that's basically going to light the sample or ignite it. And basically what you're doing is a combustion reaction. Okay. You're just burning the sample that's in there. Now, again, where's the heat going to go? Well, your knee jerk reaction is probably to say, well, hey, isn't it going to go into this black container? And the answer is yes. And that is what we call the bomb, right? So a lot of the heat is going to go into the bomb. But couldn't some of it go, go through the walls of that bomb, right? Couldn't some of the heat end up in the water? And the answer is yes. And that we have to take that into account as well. So we have the reaction, which is taking place on the inside. Maybe I should use a different color here. So we'll say Q reaction, which is taking place inside the bomb. And then the heat is going to either be absorbed by the bomb or by the water. We also have a stir, a mechanical stir inside the water. What would the purpose of that be? The purpose of that is to dissipate or to spread the heat evenly throughout the water. So you get an accurate reading of how much heat is absorbed by that water. OK, we also have a thermometer to read the temperature change in the water. Because we're going to need that to calculate um, the Q of the water. And there we go. So again, when we look at the entire constant volume calorimeter, we see that let's say we're having a we're doing a combustion reaction where heat's going to be released. What the amount of heat released is going to be the negative or the opposite of the amount of heat absorbed by the water and the bomb. So how are we going to calculate the Q of the reaction? Well, we know the specific heat of the water. And what we would usually do is do an experiment in order to calculate the heat capacity of the bomb ahead of time. So that's already done. Now, if you watched my videos, and I hope you do, for section 6.1 and 6.2, what you would have seen there is that the Q of a reaction at constant volume is actually equal to delta E. So a reaction at constant volume, we can say that the heat of our reaction is not exactly equal to enthalpy, but it's very close to enthalpy. With all that in mind, let's take a look at a problem that deals with constant volume calorimetry. It says here a quantity of 1.435 grams of naphthalene, which is a pungent smelling substance used in moth repellents, was burned in a bomb calorimeter. I don't know if any of you guys have ever used mothballs before. If you have a bunch of a drawer filled with, you know, expensive Burberry cashmere sweaters or something like that. But anyhow, that's what mothballs essentially are, is naphthalene. And one of the interesting things about naphthalene is that naphthalene is a solid at room temperature, and it's one of the few things that we talk about that actually undergoes sublimation directly at room temperature. It goes from a solid to a gas. Anyhow, that's not the point of this question, though. So we have 1.435 grams of naphthalene, um, and it's burned in a bomb calorimeter, constant volume calorimeter. Consequently, the temperature of the water rose from 20.28 to 25.95 degrees Celsius. If the heat capacity of the bomb plus the water is 10.17 kilojoules per gram degree Celsius. Calculate the heat of combustion of naphthalene on a molar basis. That is, find the molar heat of combustion. I didn't leave myself a lot of room here to solve this one, did I? Well, what I've got. Okay, let's think about this. 
we are burning in our constant volume calorimeter. So we have our constant volume calorimeter. This is for lack of a better drawing. Okay, and inside that we're burning 1.435 grams of naphthalene. Well, let's figure out how much heat is released when we burn that naphthalene. For that, since we're given heat capacity, we're not gonna use the formula Q is equal to MC times delta T. Why? Because we know since big C or heat capacity is equal to mass times specific heat, we can rewrite this formula as Q is equal to heat capacity times delta T. So there you can see it's, you know, not a very involved equation. Let's take a look. We can calculate the Q is being equal to the heat capacity of the bomb plus the water is 10.17 kilojoules per degree Celsius multiplied by our delta T, 25.95 degrees Celsius, subtract 20.28 degrees Celsius. Now the math isn't complex, but I've gone ahead and calculated it, and we end up with a Q of being equal to 57.7 kilojoules. Okay, now I want us to think very carefully about this 57.7 kilojoules. The first thing I want you to think about is if they're asking us for the molar heat of combustion, what's the sign of this Q going to be? Right? You see what I have in the black box, it just says Q is equal to 57.7 kilojoules, but we can assign assigned to this number as being positive or negative. Since this is a combustion reaction, heat is given off, isn't it? So again, since this is combustion, it's burning, heat is being released. Think about it. You burn a log on a campfire, heat is released. That means that our Q is going to be a negative number. Based off of that, we can simply write that our Q is actually equal to negative 57.7 kilojoules. Now, let's take that one step further. What about that 57.7 kilojoules? That's not 57.7 kilojoules per mole, is it? Because we want to know the combustion in the molar basis, which would be kilojoules per mole. Well, we're given the molecular formula of naphthalene, aren't we? And we're given the molar mass. So we can figure out that Q is equal to negative 57.7 kilojoules, not per mole. That would be incorrect, right? Because this isn't one mole of the compound, is it? Right. Remember, when you're writing kilojoules per mole like that, you're saying it's per one mole. But this is kilojoules per how many moles? Well, let's figure it out. It's divided by the number of moles of naphthalene, which would be calculated as so. 1.435 grams divided by the molar mass of the naphthalene, which I've already calculated ahead of time, as being 128.2 grams per mole, C8H, C10H8 rather. So 128.2 grams per mole. Look, the units on the bottom cancel, grams and grams, to give me moles. So I get that my Q, when I work all this out, is equal to negative 5.16 times 10 to the power of 3 kilojoules per mole. Okay, I can't stress this enough. The reaction that's being performed here wasn't on a mole, was it? A mole of naphthalene would be 128 grams. If the scientist had burned 128.2 grams of naphthalene, then the heat that's released is simply, that would, be, that would have been the molar heat of combustion. But since they only burned a little bit, you have to divide that amount of heat released by the number of moles that you actually burn in order to get the molar heat of combustion. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that problem. You're like, just watch me, Mr. Dion. Okay, I will destroy that problem. Okay, great. It's not a complicated problem in terms of the math, just like most of the problems that we look at in, uh, in this class. It's not mind boggling, you know, limits and, you know, calculus or anything like that. It's more about what? Reading the problem and being able to interpret that problem. That's why it's so important that you understand the concepts.
everybody in the class understands how to divide and multiply. Okay, where it gets tricky is understanding how to interpret the problem. Well, the good news is we're not done with calorimetry. Now we're going to look at the kind of calorimetry that you guys are probably used to doing. Before I started the lecture today, I asked my students, hey, have any of you done any calorimetry in the lab? And some people said, yeah, absolutely. You know, I did one you know, last week or a couple of weeks ago. Well, the calorimetry that you would have done in the lab would probably be constant pressure calorimetry. And the same principle applies with respect to the heat in constant volume calorimetry in that when we look at our constant pressure calorimeter, no heat enters or leaves the system. Now, if you've never tried constant pressure calorimetry before, you might be looking at this and saying, hey, Mr. Dion, that looks to me like it's two styrofoam cups. I'd say, yeah, you're absolutely right. Hey, you know what, this stirrer right here, I'll do you one better. That's, you can make that out of a coat hanger. So now, you're, now you got something that you took from a closet and some old styrofoam cups that could even be used. And you know what? It's surprisingly accurate. It's surprising how good a coffee cup calorimeter is. Okay? Remember, styrofoam is a good insulator. And so we do our reaction in an aqueous solution. The heat that's produced or absorbed is going to be manifested in the temperature change in the water. And again, since styrofoam is such a good insulator, no heat is going to leave the calorimeter and no heat is going to enter the calorimeter. Now, the reason why it's constant pressure is because unlike the bomb calorimeter, which was uh, where the reaction was performed in that airtight vessel inside the bomb calorimeter, the, the part that I called the bomb, well, you probably can you know, see that there's some, there's some holes, right? There's a hole here and there's a hole here. Of course, some you know, gases are going to be able to do pressure volume work here. And so at constant pressure, the heat evolved or absorbed by the reaction is going to be equal to the change in enthalpy of the reaction. And that concept that I have here in this red box, that's covered again in the videos for section 6.1 and 6.2. Please take the time to watch those videos for section 6.1 and section 6.2. All right, so how would we calculate the amount of heat released or absorbed by a reaction in a constant pressure calorimeter. The same formula that we saw with constant volume calorimetry, right? We saw that the heat released or absorbed by the reaction is going to be equal to the negative of the heat absorbed or released by the water and the calorimeter. How do we determine how much water was, say, absorbed or how much heat, of, let's say, was absorbed by the water? We'd use the formula Q is equal to MCAT. And for the calorimeter, we would have to go ahead and calculate the heat capacity of the calorimeter ahead of time. I'm sure that if you did a coffee cup calorimetry lab in the wet lab this semester, that you would have gone ahead and calculated this first before you calculated your Q of reaction. With that in mind, let's take a look at a sample problem. It's a real classic experiment. In general chemistry, if you took a piece of lead, a little pellet having a mass of 26.47 grams, and it's at 89.98 degrees Celsius. And if you're wondering, you know, how would you get it up to 89.98 degrees Celsius? Normally, you would take the lead pellet and you would put it in boiling water, okay, or hot, hot water. So you'd have the lead pellet. I don't know. What's a lead pellet look like? I don't know. This, okay. You'd have it in hot, hot water. That's at 89. 0.98 degrees Celsius, and then you would transfer that into the calorimeter, and you'd say, well, the temperature of the pellet is going to be equal to the temperature of the water. Okay. Anyhow, that's how you would do that. Then uh, what do you do? You take it, and you place it in a constant pressure calorimeter of negligible heat capacity. So again, we're, we're ignoring the heat capacity of our calorimeter, but it's got 100 milliliters of water in it, doesn't it? And then we see that the temperature increases from 22.50 to 23.17 degrees Celsius. Let's think about this very carefully, okay? We're taking this lead pellet, okay? It's at 89.98 degrees Celsius. We're gonna take it and we're gonna drop it into here. Okay, so here's our lead pellet. The temperature at that thing, when it starts out, it's at 89.98, okay? What's gonna happen when it goes in the water? If the water's only at 22.5 degrees Celsius, that means the temperature of the water is going to go up, right? The temperature of the water is going to increase 
and the temperature of the pellet is going to decrease. They're both going to meet at the same place. But look at the difference. Okay. The pellet is small. It's only 26.47 grams. The water is going to weigh about 100 grams, right? So there's a lot more water than there is lead, isn't there? So it stands to reason that the water isn't going to raise as much in temperature as the lead is going to decrease in temperature. But that's quite a big difference, right? What else do we know? We know that the specific heat of a metal like lead is a lot lower than the specific heat of water. Okay, so when we calculate the specific heat of the lead, which we could go ahead and look up in a table, but that's not the point of the problem, um, it should definitely come out as being less than the specific heat of water, shouldn't it? Okay, well, let me see if I provided myself with some space, and I didn't. Okay, so I'm going to have to do all my work on here. All right, let me delete some of this stuff while you guys are thinking about the problem, and then I'll uh, start taking a quick gander at it here. Okay, well, the first thing we know is that whatever heat is lost by the lead pellet, it's going to be the opposite of the heat gained by the water. Right, remember, we're ignoring the calorimeter. Well, another way I could write this is since Q, since I know that Q is equal to MC delta T, I could write the mass of the lead times the C of the lead times the delta T for the lead is equal to the mass of the water times the heat capacity or specific heat of the water, I should say, times the delta T of the water, like that. And you're trying to determine what the specific heat of the lead pellet is. Let's plug in some numbers in that equation. I'm gonna to try to squeeze it all in here. So the mass of our lead is 26.47 grams. We're looking for the specific heat of the lead. The delta T of the lead, well, it starts at 89.98 and it ends at 23.17. So our T final is 23.17 degrees Celsius. Subtract 89.98 degrees Celsius. That's going to be equal to the negative of the mass of the water. We're going to assume a density of 1.00 grams per milliliter. That would mean, okay, so we'll say assume density of H2O is equal to 1.00 grams per milliliter. So this is going to be 100.0 grams multiplied by the specific heat of water, which we looked at earlier. It's 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. The delta T of our water is 23.17 degrees Celsius. Subtract 22.50 degrees Celsius. Now it's just a matter of algebra, right? Nothing more than that. When we work all this out, we find that we get Negative 1,768 1, grams times degrees Celsius multiplied, multiplied, multiplied by the um, specific heat of my lead is equal to minus 280.3 joules, right? You see how grams cancel and degrees Celsius cancels. Well, when I work all that out, I get that the specific heat of my lead pellet is equal to 0 0.159159 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Now, I am not going to give you a table of specific heats on your exam, but we can compare it with, you know, what's in the textbook. So we have 0.159. Let's back up to kind of where we started off earlier today. Hey, 0.158, close enough, huh? What do you think, close enough? All right, there we go. Just wanna point out one more thing before we get, keep going here. You notice that I said, you know, the Q of the pellet is equal to the negative Q of the water. It wouldn't matter where you put that negative sign, okay? If you had written the negative, the Q, 
of the pellet is equal to the Q of the water, you're still going to get the same answer. If you do constant pressure calorimetry, you can measure some heats of typical reactions. For example, um, here's the heat of neutralization. So neutralization is when we combine an acid and a base like HCl and sodium hydroxide. And what you find is that if you do that neutralization reaction, hopefully you know that when you add an acid and a base, right, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, that's an exothermic reaction, right? That produces heat. And so it releases 56.2 kilojoules for every mole that reacts. Now, something that we're going to look at in even more detail today with respect to Hess's law is that if you do the reverse of a reaction, you're going to reverse the sign of the change in enthalpy. Take a look at this next reaction here. You have water decomposing or ionizing and forming a proton plus hydroxide. And you notice that the sign is the exact opposite of this. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on, you're missing a bunch of elements there, Mr. Dion. Well, if we think about this neutralization reaction that's occurring right here, right? This is the molecular equation. If you write out the net ionic equation, the net ionic equation for that reaction is actually H plus aqueous plus hydroxide aqueous produces H2O liquid, right? And the delta H is equal to negative 56.2 kilojoules per mole, right? Why can I write that down? Because sodium and chloride are spectator ions. Well, now, if you compare this reaction and this reaction, they're just the same reaction written in reverse. So all we do is flip the sign of the change in enthalpy. The next one shows the heat of fusion of water. So fusion is um, means melting. Okay, so fusion is melting. Now, I know that you don't think of fusion as being melting. We probably don't, but in chemistry, that's the word that we use for it. Well, how much energy does it take to melt one mole of ice? Water in the solid phase, we call that ice. It takes 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Whereas the heat of vaporization converting water into steam takes a lot more energy, doesn't it? If you think about that, it makes sense because when you convert a solid to a liquid, the particles are still going to be close together. So it requires a lot less energy than the conversion from a liquid to a gas where you have to provide those particles with much more kinetic energy so that they can be further apart. Here's another heat of reaction for a single displacement reaction where magnesium chloride is reacting with sodium. You can see that there's a lot of heat evolved in that reaction. So you could classify that as a highly exothermic reaction. Let's take a look at another problem. Good gravy. I didn't give myself a lot of space to solve this. I might have to go to a blank slide to cover this one. Okay, it says here a quantity of 1.00 times 10 to the 2 milliliters. So that's the same thing as saying that's 100 milliliters for three sig figs of 0.5 molar HCl. So that means we've got 100 mils of 0 0.500 molar HCl is mixed with 100 milliliters of 0 0.500 molar sodium hydroxide. So we've got 100 mils of 0 0.500 molar sodium hydroxide. So you're taking the acid and base, you know, mix them together in a constant pressure calorimeter of negligible heat capacity. That means we can ignore it. The initial temperature of both solutions. So somebody left them out on the bench overnight to make sure they're at the room temperature, which is 22.5 degrees Celsius. You mix them and they create heat, don't they? We saw earlier, the last slide, as a matter of fact, that neutralization is an exothermic reaction. 
So the temperature of the water went up to 25.86 degrees Celsius. Calculate the heat change for the neutralization on a molar basis. Okay, assume that the densities and specific heats of the solutions are the same as that for water. And um, yeah, for water. So one gram per milliliter and 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Well, how many moles of sodium hydroxide are we reacting with how many moles of hydrochloric acid? That's the first thing we want to figure out, don't we? We have this equation. Sodium hydroxide in the aqueous phase is combining with hydrochloric acid to produce sodium chloride plus H2O. Okay, first let's determine how much sodium hydroxide we have. Well, we have 100 milliliters, and remember that 100 milliliters in one liter, there's a thousand milliliters, so that's equal to 0 0.100 liters, right? Then 0 0.100 liters multiplied by 0 0.500 moles per liter, right? Because the concentration of both solutions was 0 0.500 molar. When we multiply that out, we see that the number of moles of our sodium hydroxide is equal to 0 0.0500 moles. Let's do the same thing for hydrochloric acid. This is where understanding stoichiometry is really important, right? Okay, so for hydrochloric acid, we're starting with the same amount, 0 0.100 liters. We have the same concentration. You can see where I'm going with this, hopefully. So like Mr. Dion, you're just doing the same thing twice. Yeah, I am. So we're in a three. All right, so we get the number of moles of HCl is equal to 0 0.0500 moles. Notice also that the stoichiometric ratio of sodium hydroxide to HCl is one to one. They're combined in a one to one ratio, and you're combining equal amounts of each of them. The number of moles of sodium hydroxide is equal to the number of moles of HCl. So there is no limiting reactant to worry about here. Okay. All right. Well, what else do we know? We know that the Q of our reaction, of our neutralization reaction, is going to be equal to the negative of the Q of the water, right? Because when you combine these two reactants, they're going to create heat, and that heat is going to go where? Into the water. That means that the Q of our reaction is going to be equal to The negative of the mass of the H2O multiplied by the specific heat of water times the change in temperature of the water. Let's plug in some numbers. The mass of our H2O is the total, right? We're adding 100 milliliters and 100 milliliters. If each solution is 100 milliliters, right? 100 mils plus 100 mils. That means on this side, we have a total of 200 milliliters of solution. The mass is the total, which is 200 grams, because we know that the density of water is one gram per milliliter. We have 200 grams times the specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, times our delta T. How much did the temperature go up? It went up to 25 0.86 degrees Celsius from 22.50 degrees Celsius. When we punch all of that spinach into our calculator, we get to the Q of our reaction. Look, my units cancel. We get the Q of our reaction in joules is equal to negative 2.81 times 10 to the power of 3 joules, which is equal to minus 2.8. 2.81 kilojoules. But remember, we're trying to calculate the heat change for the neutralization reaction on a molar basis. This isn't one mole that we're reacting, is it? We reacted half a mole, or zero, oh, sorry, 0 0.05 mole and 0 0.05 moles. So that means that this is per 0 
zero zero moles, right? Because that's the maximum amount of sodium sodium chloride in water that I could produce. When we divide that, we end up with look negative fifty six point two kilojoules per mole as the heat released from our reaction. So that is going to be equal to our delta H in constant pressure calorimetry, isn't it? Our change in enthalpy is going to be negative 56.2 kilojoules per mole. Look familiar? Well, let's copy it. Look at that. There's the answer to our problem. And there's the heat of neutralization. Of, or there's the heat of neutralization. There we go. Looks pretty reasonable to me. OK. Well, let's talk about phase changes for a little bit. We talked about a neutralization reaction. We talked about a combustion reaction. What about changing the phase of a substance. What are phase changes? Going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid? Going from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid? Well, phase changes do involve enthalpy, but what's important that you understand is that there's no change in temperature during a phase change. Now, that might not be intuitive to you, but if you take a block of ice at zero degrees Celsius, the temperature is always going to be zero degrees Celsius until all of the ice is gone. Once the ice is completely disappeared, then the temperature of the water can start to rise. Okay, so that's the kind of concept, or that's the kind of rationale you want to approach this with. No change in temperature during a phase change. Now, in terms of phase changes, there's two types. We can have endothermic phase changes or exothermic phase changes. When we're dealing with endothermic phase changes, those are ones that are going to absorb heat. The two types of endothermic phase changes we're interested in are melting, which we sometimes call fusion. Okay. Okay. In fact, you see um, fusion shown right here. I know, again, that you don't like, you don't say, hey, the ice is fusing. Well, that's what we use in chemistry. Or vaporization, which is the conversion of a liquid to a gas. When we're dealing with exothermic phase changes, these include freezing or condensation. You probably noticed that these are just the opposite of each other. Melting and freezing are opposites, and vaporization and condensation are opposites. Pure substances that have a delta H have a value of delta H that corresponds to melting or vaporization. So you notice down here, let's say, for example, if we examine benzene, it's got a value for the delta H of fusion and a value for the delta H of vaporization. You notice that it doesn't have a delta H for freezing or condensation. They're not on here, right? The reason why is because if you want to have the delta H for freezing, all you have to do is take the delta H of fusion and add a negative sign to it, right? Because freezing and melting are opposite processes. So this is going to be equal to the negative of the delta H of freezing. Same thing applies for vaporization. This is going to be equal to the negative of the delta H for condensation. All right, so let's say you wanted to know the amount of heat released when one mole of benzene um, freezes, it would be negative 9.84 kilojoules per mole. So how do we calculate the heat of a phase change? We take the delta H of the phase change and we multiply that by the number of moles. Let's talk about the rules for thermochemical equations. Now, the first two of these are covered in my videos that cover sections 6.1 and 
Let's review those. The magnitude of the change in enthalpy is directly proportional to the amount of reactant or product. Another way of saying is that that is that the more of a substance there is, the more energy produced or needed for that reaction. Think about it. If I burn one gram of propane, there's going to be some heat released. But if I burn a thousand grams of propane, there's going to be a lot more heat produced. And so again, the magnitude of that delta H, that change in enthalpy, is proportional to the amount of reactant or product. The change in enthalpy for the reaction is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign for the change in enthalpy of the reverse reaction. We've seen this a couple times today. We looked at the ionization of water, and we compared it to a neutralization reaction, which had the exact same, or had a net ionic equation, rather, that was the same as the ionization of water. We saw that their delta H's were just the same in magnitude, but opposite in sign. But this is a new one. This is something that I didn't cover in the videos for section 6.1 and 6.2. The value of change in enthalpy is the same whether the reaction occurs in one step or as a series of steps. The reason why we can say this is because delta H is a state function, or as it says here, a state variable. Now, again, we saw earlier on that state functions were things like pressure, volume, temperature. The fact that enthalpy is also a state function, it, the way that we um, define that is called Hess's law. And it's as such that the total change in enthalpy is going to be equal to the sums of the change in enthalpy of all the steps that we took to get our final result. Again, enthalpy is a state function. With that in mind, let's try a practice problem. If you're given the following equation, two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen produces two moles of water. Here's the delta H value associated with that reaction. Negative 571.6 kilojoules per mole. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Because that's a combustion reaction, isn't it? We're combining hydrogen in the presence of water, or sorry, oxygen. We're forming water, and we're releasing a lot of heat, 561 kilojoules for every mole. Um, but what I need you to understand is that this value, this value right here is associated with this specific equation. Okay, so this per mole here, you could express that as negative 571.6 kilojoules per two moles of hydrogen, per one mole of oxygen, per two moles of water. Again, I can't stress this enough, and I'm just going to repeat the same thing, but this value is for this equation, no other equation. With that knowledge in mind, let us calculate the delta H for this equation right here, where we have water is producing hydrogen gas, and half a mole of oxygen. Well, hopefully you can see that this is the reverse of the first process, right? We flipped it around. If we flip it around, what do we have to do? We have to change the sign. Not only do we have to change the sign from negative to positive, but what else happened? Here we had two moles of hydrogen. Here we only have one mole of hydrogen. Here we had one mole of oxygen. Here we have half a mole of oxygen. Here we have two moles of water. Here we have one mole of water. What else did we do? We divided it in two. So we're going to have to take this number, 571.6. We're going to change the sign, positive 571.6 kilojoules per mole. And then we're going to divide it in half. That's going to give us this number right here. Negative 280. Sorry, that's not going to give us that number at all, is it? That's going to get son of a gun. That's going to give us this number right here. And this number is associated with this equation. H2O liquid produces hydrogen gas plus half a mole of oxygen gas. Okay, that's this equation right here. I can't stress that enough. Okay, let me get the green highlighter. Where is it? A little green in here. Okay, this number is associated with this equation. 
And this number is associated with this specific equation. Give me a thumbs up for me on that. All right, I'll take that to the bank. Let's take a look at another problem. To produce silicon used in semiconductors, sand or silicon dioxide um, from sand, a reaction is used that can be broken down into these three steps. So we've got three beautiful reactions here. We've got step one, step two, and step three. All right, write the thermochemical equation for the overall reaction for the formation of silicon from silicon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and magnesium from silicon dioxide. Carbon monoxide and magnesium chloride are byproducts. Okay. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to form silicon from silicon dioxide. That means that we're going to start off with silicon dioxide, which you can see is a solid. We're going to end up with silicon, which is a solid, as a product. They're telling us that we're also end up ending up with carbon monoxide gas. Get that from here. Plus, yeah, plus magnesium chloride, which is a solid, and a product. Well, if I have carbon in carbon monoxide, where's that going to come from? It's going to come from solid carbon. Let's write that in. If I have magnesium in my magnesium chloride, where is that going to come from? It's going to come from magnesium. So I have to have magnesium. I'm going to run out of space here, won't I? And they put a smaller arrow in here. And if I have kind of a gun, come on, here we go. If I have chlorine in my final product in magnesium chloride, that's going to come from Cl2 gas. Okay, so here's the equation that I'm trying to produce. I want to get this overall equation. And if it's a thermochemical equation, I have to provide the delta H value. Delta H is equal to something in kilojoules per mole. First thing I'm noticing here is that this equation is unbalanced. I have one silicon over here, one here. That looks okay. I have two oxygens over here, and I only have one over here. So I'm going to put a two in front of my carbon monoxide. I also have two chlorines here, two chlorines there. And then I've got two carbons. So I'm going to have to put those like this. Like that. And now I've got one silicon on each side, I've got two oxygens on each side, I've got two carbons on each side. I've got Trying to figure out 